come and behold him. Isn't he fascinating? I'm so glad that we ended this time of worship declaring that. And I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about God our Father, but I want you to know that as we behold him, he is smiling over you. There, there's a verse that I quote often, and matter of fact, I just realized recently that I've been saying it wrong, and I've kind of got it wrong. And it's a verse, I think it's found uh, in Nehemiah, and it talks about how the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I was always a person who, whenever I was confronted with circumstances or, or bad news or or whatever the case may be, I would always say, I have joy and that's going to be my strength. Now, that is true because the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and, and joy, and that is alive in me. But the verse I would always use says the joy of the Lord is my strength. So it's not just my joy that that verse is talking about. It's the joy of the Lord that is my strength. You see, whenever we think about God our Father and who he is and how he views us, it's always with a smile on his face. And it's the joy that he has for us, his children, that builds up and strengthens us to endure whatever we go through. And that's the God that we serve. And that's the God that we, that we preach in this place because he really is so good. And as we behold him, I want you to know it is a permanent smile. That smile never turns into a frown. It's permanent. And that's how he looks at you with that smile. Amen. Amen. Can we just celebrate that one time in this place this morning? Amen. What a beautiful time of worship. At this time, we're going to dismiss our middle and high schoolers. The rest of you can find your seat. You know, we are um, in the middle of a series that we've titled Navigating Minefields. And the last few weeks, honestly, has been so helpful to me as I think about approaching the relationships in my life to make sure that I'm a person who is maybe uh, not triggered easily, that I've conquered some of those things in my mind and I know that everyone who's been up here to preach over the last few weeks Mikey and Corey they've done an absolute amazing job and I know today that we're going to be completely blessed and encouraged and also challenged because today we have Bishop Jamie Englehart with us and those of you that are new this is someone who has really imparted a lot into this place into my life over the last 14 15 years and really the good news that that we preach in this place he is someone that really deposited a seed of the message of grace years ago and it's fully grown and developed not just the message of grace but the message of kingdom and love and empowerment and really Bishop Jamie means a lot to me, and I know all of you are encouraged. You let me know every time he preaches that there's something new that you learn, and I know today is going to be another one of those Sundays that we leave this place fully empowered and encouraged. So would you help me welcome and honor Bishop Jamie as he comes? Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Corey. Good morning, everyone. It is good to be here. I look forward every year to Thanksgiving for two reasons. I get to be home normally the whole week, and then I speak home, and then I get to be home next week. And so that's always great, especially when you've got a crazy schedule many times like mine. But uh, it is always good to be home and in our home church and always have an amazing time, as always, bless Pastor Shannick and Melanie and the whole team here, which are dear to our hearts, of course, because 
we also got family. That's a part of that. So uh, we can't help but love everybody here, and everyone else has become family too. So uh, it's always good to be home. Uh, just real quick, I know there's always new people that come through. I know a lot of you have purchased my book in the past. I'm working on right now my second one on the gospel, and uh, hopefully this next year uh, we'll we'll get that taken care of and done. And uh, But out on the foyer, I will have some of these books. I encourage you to check them out. Uh, along with a bunch of other stuff, have a whole bunch of stuff also on the website that you can check out. And uh, please just avail yourself to all of that. We'd appreciate it. Well, turn with me to Luke 19. Let me get right to my assignment this morning. Luke 19. Pastor Shannick had mentioned to me the series, and, and he always tells me, he said, now you preach whatever is on your heart, but this is the series we're in. And he said, you always do a good job of weaving it in no matter what. I've spoken over the last 34 years at enough conferences to where they give me a theme, and I, I tend to somehow be able to stick it in there uh, some way or another, but uh, actually this one fits phenomenal with the message I've been sharing over about the last five months as I've traveled around the country, and I believe, I believe it's, it's very important for us today. So read with me, very familiar story, Luke 19, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into his sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they, all the religious people, as well as his own disciples, saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I will give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, normally we stop there in most of our Bible reading because then there is a little break and then the next thing says the parable of the minas, but the close of this st actual story is in the next verse. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable, Jesus, because he was near Jerusalem and because they, everyone traveling with him, thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but that jumped off the page at me several years ago, that... What the disciples and the Pharisees and Sadducees, everybody that was traveling with Jesus, because he was constantly surrounded by those who loved him and those who hated him at the same time. But this passage tells us that what they saw in the story of Zacchaeus caused them to think the kingdom of God would immediately appear. In other words, what they saw in this story, they literally thought, there was going to be a manifestation of heaven. Now, I'm going to get to that right near the end, but in the meantime, we need to kind of tie this down. I've shared bits and pieces. I love mentioning Zacchaeus a lot of times as I preach because Jesus went against the grain when it came to our idea even of preaching the gospel. A lot of how many of us in here perhaps were raised is that the gospel is that God was really mad and God was really angry and God can't stand us and he doesn't look at us because God's holy and he can't look on sin. And it's not till we repent and turn from all of our wicked ways and then turn towards him, then he turns towards us. And, and in other words, the mindset of a lot of churchianity and Phariseeism and religion is believe what we believe, then change, then we'll accept you. But Jesus shows up, and he's the polar opposite. He just says, hey, Zach, I accept you. No strings attached, no idea of do this, jump through this hoop. Uh, he, he gave him no work to do. He just simply said, I must come to your house. And so I want to break this down a little bit because I believe it's extremely important, especially with navigating mindsets, and we're going to deal with maybe three main mindsets that tend to be triggers in people's lives and things that keep us at times from really seeing a manifestation of heaven in our lives and the kingdom demonstrated. The first thing we've got to start off with is the name Zacchaeus. The very name Zacchaeus actually is translated pure and innocent. So allow me, if you will, to liken Zacchaeus 
to all of humanity because in every human there's something pure and there's something innocent that's longing to see Jesus and reconnect to where we came from, to reconnect the New Age movement. They, they even get it, and they don't even understand it. They say, we need to reconnect with source. Well, you know, what's interesting is the very word father, pater in the Greek, means originator or source. And so regardless of the language that people feel in every single religion, I believe there's something inside of every human that's longing to reconnect to where they came from. Because we came from the Father, just like Jesus. He said, I come from the Father, and I'm making my way back to the Father. So our whole journey is we started in him. That's why you need to hear this closely. According to Paul, you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That means you were found in Christ before you were ever lost in Adam. That's really good news right there. Listen, I'm here to tell you the good news is before the foundation of the world, his heart was always towards you and it was never against you. And inside of every Zacchaeus, every human on the planet, there's something pure longing out. Matter of fact, we're told in Ecclesiastes, it's called eternity, that God has placed eternity in every single heart. In John chapter 1, it's light because Jesus is the light of the world and that light came into this world and is the light of every man. That means every human carries the light of God in him. It's called the imagio Deo, the image of God. Paul would put it like this. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one father of us all who is above all and through all and in all. That means he was in you before you ever invited him in. He was always there trying to reconnect us to himself. That is why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, anyone who turns to Christ the veil or the separation, which is on their mind, is removed. When you remove a veil, what happens? Something doesn't appear that was not there. What was always there is just now seen. Paul called it in Galatians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he said, by the way, the message that's been hidden from the ages is not Christ to you. It's Christ in you. That's better news than y'all just responded to right there. That means he was in you before you ever prayed a magic prayer. You just didn't recognize it. You didn't know it because inside of every human. Now, now normally what screams on the inside of us is much of the gospel that we've heard because we, 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 we've heard, most of us have probably heard someone say, yeah, but there's none righteous, no, not one. And it's like, oh, no, yeah, there's nothing pure in you. There's nothing good in man. Man is nothing but filthy and rotten and nasty. And, and, and yet we take that one verse completely out of context because the rest of the verse says, and none seek the Lord. But yet more than a dozen times, all through scripture there were people that were actually called righteous more than a dozen times Abraham was called righteous Moses was considered righteous Zechariah John the Baptist's dad was called righteous but then it goes on to say none seek him no not one there's all kinds of people that have sought him through scripture so you can't take that verse and apply it to all of humanity just because you want to smoke the original sin pipe and convince everybody how depraved they are just simply because you're depraved, and so in your mind, you're depraved, and so you want to make everybody else that way. But instead, here's Zacchaeus. There's something in him that is purely crying out, but there were two main hindrances to Zacchaeus seeing Jesus. The first one, Scripture says that he was short of stature, which, you know, we know that meant, obviously, that he was shorter, but, you know... In this politically correct world, I'm not even sure you can call anybody short anymore. He was vertically challenged, height challenged, I, you know, I, I don't know. But we know that that was a natural condition. He was short, but I think it's bigger than that. I think it speaks more to a mental blockage, if you may. It's, it's how people view themselves because Scripture tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't say all were born in sin. And that, you, you, listen, you, I, I'm not going to take a bunch of time to try to discuss that. David said he was conceived in sin, not born in sin, because the same David said he was conceived in sin. It's because the very act of his conception was actually he was an illegitimate legitimate child. That's why when Samuel shows up to pour oil over the sons of Jesse, David's not included. Why? Because he's a bastard out in the back 40. 
All right, listen, it says he was conceived in sin. It means the very act of his conception is he was considered an illegitimate child because his father was not married to his mother, especially under the law that would have been considered. And so how, how would David say in one minute that he's literally born a sinner, and then at the next minute he'd say in Psalm 139, I was fearfully and wonderfully made. All the days ordained for me were written in the book. Matter of fact, my inner parts were knit, that, that God sees me as beautiful. But wait a minute, no, he doesn't. He sees you as Nasty. It kind of seems like David's confused. Anyway, are y'all here? We doing okay? All right. I know it's a holiday weekend. We're still a little turkey drunk. Because <laughs> you've probably been eating it for four days, three, four days now. <laughs> Many people, it's not the sin problem that keeps them from seeing Jesus. It's the perception of themselves. It's It's our own shortcomings. It's our own views of ourselves. It's that we're, we're, we're less than, we're not valuable. We're, it's our own self-condemnation and our own self-talk. It's our own old ways of thinking. And a lot of it is what we were taught in church, that you're just a filthy, rotten, stinking little worm, that you're just a nobody and a nothing. And, and until you pray a prayer, God wants nothing to do with you at all, and that just is horrendous. Because what father wants nothing to do with his kids just because they messed up? See, once you view Scripture through the lens of father, not just judge, not just justice, is God just? Yes, he is, but his justice is based on his love and his goodness. It's not based on retribution. But the good news is Jesus took care of the sin problem. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the better news is he's no longer counting men's sins against them. That means your sin and your issue does not keep God from you. Your sin at times may keep you from God, but never God from you. It brings an alienation, the Colossians 1 says, a separation in our minds. Does sin affect us? Yes, sin leads to death, but the good news is Jesus dealt with the sin issue. So just stop freaking out about it. Took care of it. But the second thing that kept him from seeing Jesus is the main problem that we deal with in the West especially. It wasn't his short stature, it was the crowd running with Jesus. Let's be honest, a lot of times the greatest hindrance to people seeing Jesus is those who claim to follow Jesus. Why, why, why is it that CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, it don't matter who it is, that the news, they always, whenever they interview a Christian, they choose the crazy ones. I was interviewing Westboro Baptist. I mean, I mean, let's be honest. Have you ever watched something before and you're like, that doesn't represent me. That's not the Jesus I serve. I don't even know what this guy's even talking about. This, this stuff over here is crazy. See, sometimes the biggest, the biggest hindrance, it's like Gandhi made, the, made it famous when he said, you're Christ, I like your Christians. Not too much, but then I like to tell people all the time, I said, listen, don't hold Jesus accountable for humans and what they do because there's no such thing as a perfect human. Jesus was the perfect human. People are going to let you down. He won't let you down. But what keeps a lot of people from really seeing Jesus is that crowd running with him that are full of toxic thinking and full of prejudice. See, number one, it's, it's, it's our prejudice to ourselves, how we think about ourselves, because you can't love your neighbor till you love yourself. So if you got wrong thinking about who you are and about how God sees you, then it's going to affect everything else. But the second thing it's going to affect is then how you treat other people, because how I, how I view God is how I view myself and then ultimately how I treat other humans. 
And if you remember the story, one thing, one thing I love about Zacchaeus is Zacchaeus was smart enough to say, you know what, I'm not going to let this crowd keep me from seeing Jesus. So he climbs up into a tree, not just any tree, but a sycamore tree. It's actually translated in the Greek language as an imperfect fig tree. And fig trees all through Scripture was a type of all kinds of things. They be- most scholars believe that Adam and Eve covered themselves with figs. It's a picture of self-righteousness. But fig tree is also a picture of natural Israel and times a picture of the church. There's all kinds of pr- prophetic typology through Scripture with that. But, but I think the important part is not that it was a fig tree, but that it was an imperfect fig tree because all of us are called as the righteous trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Psalm says that the righteous are like a palm tree because a palm tree in a storm very rarely ever breaks. It just bends because it's rooted and grounded so deep. And most people are need to climb up on us and pick the fruit fruit that they see on our lives so they can see Jesus because some will never see him until they see him in us. I don't know if you remember the story one time, but Jesus prays for a man who was blind, and he says, what do you see? And the man said, man said I see men walking as trees. Then Jesus prays for him again and said, now what do you see? And then his eyes opened up, and I remember when I was a kid, we had an evangelist that would come every year and He'd preach that sermon for some reason. Every year he'd preach that same sermon, and it was, it was called a second touch. If you get prayed for the first time and nothing happens, you just need a second touch because Jesus didn't heal him the first time, but he prayed for him a second time, and I was like, I think Jesus could have handled it the first time. I don't, I don't think that was the point. I think the point was that he gave the man spiritual sight before he gave him natural sight because trees don't walk around. Trees are rooted. They're grounded. And they're planted. And I think what God gave him was spiritual sight to see all the Pharisees and Sadducees around Jesus who had no root system because they were not rooted and grounded. Scripture says what we're to be rooted and grounded in is not power, not even grace, not faith. We're to be rooted and grounded in love. See, most people aren't looking for a perfect tree to pick fruit. They're just looking for one that'll love them. Just one that's rooted and grounded. I don't need perfection. I just need to know that you care. Do you care? So he's up in the tree, and Jesus does something that's absolutely amazing. Jesus does the opposite of a Pharisee. Jesus does the opposite of American street preachers. Notice Jesus doesn't say, hey, you filthy little heathen. You've been ripping people off. I see you up there. You need to repent right now because you're going to hell in a handbasket. Not one mention of any of that. Jesus didn't even point his finger. Jesus does something that's radical because this is how the Pharisees would do it. The Pharisees would say, believe what we believe, then change, then we'll accept you. In other words, believe, straighten up. I mean, I I still remember the day, you know, growing up in church, I'm a preacher's kid, and I I remember, remember one time we had two young guys get saved on a Sunday. And the next Sunday, one guy come back, and he's got a suit and tie on, and his, his hair was all straightened up. His tattoos were covered up. And, I mean, I, I, man, he's just he's praising God right away. The other guy, he's still smoking out in the parking lot, and, you know, he cussed a couple times in the foyer. And I remember folks saying, well, now the one guy, he got really saved. <laughs> now that other guy, we, he got saved, but, yeah, you know. But the other guy, boy, whoa, the one that started looking like us and acting like it, he got really saved. I don't know about this other guy. Truth is, they both got saved, accepted Jesus. They experienced salvation, but conversion is a process for all of us. That's why Peter said the end of your faith is the salvation of your soul, not the beginning of your faith. The end of your faith. Why? Because now you're working out your salvation. And for everybody, there's different speeds. There's different process of that. We all walk through those things a little differently. But Jesus' response is not believe, change, and we accept you. Jesus just said, I accept you. Period. But then what happened is everybody got mad. Why did everybody get mad? Prejudice. See, prejudice comes in all forms and all manners. You can be, you can be prejudiced towards the poor. You can be prejudiced towards the rich. You can be prejudiced towards colors of skin. You can be prejudiced towards cultures. One thing I've learned now about going to Europe, 
uh, Europeans don't understand our, our, our like white and black issue in the States. It's no comprehension to them because the people they're prejudiced against are gypsies. Seriously, I mean, they, they got no issue over there with like black folk or Hispanic folk, different colors. They're just like them gypsies. You know, I'm, I remember, and I'm like, gypsies, you know, just reminds me of movies, gypsies, you know, just, I mean, like, what? But see, they got all these ideas, gypsies do this and gypsies do that. And, and so everybody in some form, some, some it's prejudice. I mean, I just had a really good weekend because Michigan beat Ohio State, hallelujah. It's a good weekend. I'm a happy camper. Hopefully Corey is, because I, I, I know, because I, we all got to be against Ohio State if we're from Michigan, just, even if you're a state fan. But I, I know people in Ohio that won't talk to people in Michigan. I know people that are Michigan State fans that won't talk to someone who's a, a University of Michigan fan. See, see, prejudice comes in all kinds of, of manners and, and attitudes, and we, we, we get ideas towards people. And, and what triggers people sometimes more than anything else is our prejudging. And let me tell you something. Everybody around Jesus, they had attitudes, boy, because Jesus was now going to have a meal with a tax collector. Nothing was worse. I mean, you literally, in that culture, a tax collector was the bottom of the barrel. This is someone who had no friends that were Jews because there's no doubt, and, and who knows? I mean, you know, who knows what Zacchaeus experienced? I mean, you know, it says he was short, so maybe he was picked last in school. Maybe he was made fun of. Maybe people said names to him. They called him certain things, and he got to a certain age, and the Romans come along and say, listen, these folks don't even like you anyway. They've made fun of you, so why don't you come in collusion with us? And so no Jew liked him because he was stealing from them and giving to their captors, and the Romans didn't like the guy because who trusts? someone who's in collusion against his own people. So this, this guy's the worst of the worst. You're talking about questionable? This guy was the questionable person there. And Jesus did something that he was famous for. He loved to mess with self-righteous, prejudiced people and hang out with the people they didn't believe were worth it. His whole attitude. He'd get around people and they'd be like, he's hanging out with sinners. He's hanging out with people he shouldn't have anything to do with. Don't you know they're not even children of Abraham? Because literally the Pharisees didn't even think that Zacchaeus was a child of Abraham. He's outside the covenant. He's a nobody. And when Jesus said, I accept you, I must come to your house, you got to understand in Eastern culture, to go to someone's house to stay the night and to have a meal, you not only were accepting them, but you were accepting everything that was a part of them, including their lifestyle. Jesus was amazing at just turning the apple cart upside down. I have people all the time that tell me, you know, well, you know, you're, you have a platform, you know, you're a bishop who lead churches, you know, you, you need to have a stance against certain lifestyles. And I'm like, I don't, I don't preach about any lifestyle. I'm not affirming of any lifestyle because I'm not even affirming my own sometimes. Just run into me on a bad day. My job's not to affirm lifestyles, it's to affirm humans. If we all hung out together, we'd probably find something we disagree about. We probably find something we don't like about each other. That's not our job. It's not, about, it's not about lifestyle. It's about humanity is valuable. Humans are valuable. Zacchaeus was valuable even though everybody there didn't think he was valuable. And let me tell you something. When we have a heart of prejudging or prejudice towards any other human, we're, we're loved by God. You can be saved on your way to heaven. Everybody say amen. I ain't sending nobody to hell today. Listen, God loves you, and that's not going to change his mind, but it doesn't mean... You're following Jesus. You literally cannot be full of prejudice and be a true follower of Jesus. You can have accepted Jesus. You can be loved by Jesus. But a follower of Jesus? You talk about a toxic mindset that triggers people. I'm telling you what, you, 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 you want to trigger me? I can get triggered real quick. Just try to tell my two little granddaughters that they're multiracial. You want to see someone get triggered? I'm going to let you know right now. Uh-uh. A human came together with another human and produced a human. 
That's not multiracial. It's the same race, just different hues. When my son and child finally have a baby, hallelujah, just, I've been waiting for that little black grandbaby, just going to be so beautiful. I'm going to just want to kiss that baby all to pieces. If I'm walking down the mall and someone says, oh, just, uh, listen, it's going to take every bit of the grace of God for me to not just beat someone and then tell Jesus that they died. Anyway, hallelujah. <laughs> See, the Jews were worse at this. They were prejudiced against Samaritans. They were, see, to a Jew, loving your neighbors you loved yourself meant you loved other Jews. You didn't have to love those people. We all in some form, if we think about it, we've got areas of our lives where, where it's easy for us. We get attitudes towards certain people groups or certain attitudes towards individuals, and, and, and we let that just drive things in us, and we're not even thinking about how does Jesus feel about this. I feel like I'm preaching better than y'all are helping me, but you're getting quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> We're about to step into an election year. Help us, Jesus. People that are Republicans that won't talk to Democrats. Democrats won't talk to Republicans. Conservatives won't talk to liberals. <laughs> Don't you know? Prejudice. It's a major, major mindset change. Mindset changes says I have no enemies because I'm to love what a perceived enemy is. I'm, I'm not to render evil for evil. I'm, I'm to turn the other cheek. I'm, I'm, I'm to actually live like Jesus. And Jesus lived his life hanging out with the very people that some of us would struggle. Jesus hanging out with prostitutes and publicans. Can you imagine? Jesus let a known, a known prostitute literally rub him down with essential oils and give him a pedicure. He's sitting at a table having a meal, reclining, and she comes in and just starts pouring oil on his feet, and he didn't sit there and say, you should stay away from me, you sinner. You thou as shouldest not as touchest me. He's just sitting there going, hey. I'm telling you, I'm with Jesus on this one. You want to rub my feet, I don't care what you're into. I'm. I love my feet being rubbed. <laughs> you want to rub them, tickle them? I don't, I don't care, but I just like my feet being touched. But don't ask me to touch yours. I, 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 I don't like to touch feet. That's why when I ordain people, God tells me to wash their feet, and I'm like, can I do something different? I, I don't like to touch feet, but I like my feet touched. What's interesting is, Zacchaeus then comes running down from the tree. He runs to Jesus and said, if I've stolen from anyone or defrauded them, I'm returning it fourfold. If, he said, I'm also going to give half of everything I own to the poor. And Jesus says something crazy. Wow, salvation has come to this house. Wait a minute, how'd that happen? Jesus never said nothing to him about how to get saved. Jesus never told him to repent of his sins, turn from all of his wicked ways. Jesus never said anything. All he said was, I accept you. In all your issues, in all of your mess, I accept you just the way that you are, whether I agree with it or not. You see, saying I accept someone doesn't mean you agree with everything they do. Listen, I love my children and my grandchildren. My acceptance to them is unconditional because they're mine. It doesn't mean I've always liked everything they've done. There's times I've wanted to choke them. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether I love and accept because if I'm a follower of Jesus, the most toxic mindset we can have is that of a Pharisee. Do you know that the word Pharisee literally means separatist? Anytime you have a mindset of us people and those people, you're just a good Pharisee. Whew. You say amen or oh me. That's all that Phariseeism is. It's a division when Jesus came to remove the middle wall of partition so that now in Christ there's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, black or white. There is no division. We're all one in him because I am my brother's keeper. Because every human is valuable. 
regardless of what they look like, regardless of their background, regardless of what they're into or what they're not into. They're valuable because he died for every single one. So then Jesus says, wow, salvation has come to this house. For he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Notice not who was lost, but that which is lost, because everything that Adam lost, Jesus came to get that back. It's bigger than just getting you out of somewhere into somewhere else. It's bigger than just getting you into heaven. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why all through Scripture it says things like this. I, I want to restore to you the years the palmer worm and the canker worm are stolen. I want to restore to you. If you've lost for my sake fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters, I will restore to you fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters in this life and the lifetime to come, and I'm going to restore it to you a hundredfold. In other words, everything that you have lost, he's concerned about more than just your soul. And so what was restored in this instance? Money. What was restored? He was ripping people off. And what does Zacchaeus do? Social justice. This is not an issue of Democrat and Republican, conservative and liberal. Social justice is a kingdom issue. It says we want, we want to make a difference in the world around us because if we want to see heaven manifest on earth, you know what? You have an initiative like you help people find housing. If you want to see heaven on earth. So, so the next thing that happens is Jesus heads off to Jerusalem. He starts telling another story, and all of a sudden everybody around him, they thought that heaven would immediately appear. Why? Because of what they just saw. See, to a Jew, there were, there were five main signs that someone was a Messiah, and I'll land this plane. Number one, blind eyes open, deaf ears unstopped, lepers cleanse, and the dead raised. They'd seen those four things. And they're like, man, we believe he's the Messiah. But there was one they hadn't seen yet. Because to a Jew, one of the also main signs that someone was a Messiah is when they begin to see the wealth of the wicked get released to others. Because the last time a deliverer, a savior, set them free out of Egypt, when Moses brought them out of Egypt, they left Egypt with 480 years of back pay. They came out with bags of gold and silver and all kinds of stuff. I mean, literally, can you imagine the frustrating part about it is that for 40 years, there's no subdivision, there's no mall. I mean, ladies, God wouldn't even let your shoes wear out. I mean, for crying out loud, you couldn't even buy no new shoes. Imagine you're now a multimillionaire and you got no place to spend it. Because you know why? It wasn't about it wasn't about you having money. It wasn't about you building a house. It was building God a house. Because one of the greatest examples of giving we see in all of Scripture is Moses says it's time to build God a house. And the people brought such an offering that Moses had to say, stop. Has a pretty major toxic mindset in our lives is when we're stingy. As followers of Jesus, we know he gave and so we give. And it's more than just giving something to the church and more than just giving something to a ministry. It's literally living a lifestyle of generosity that when you're at Myers or you're at Walmart or at Kroger's and that single mom's got three kids in the basket and she's going through her coupons and there's all kinds of groceries, she said, I got to put those back, I can't afford it. You can step up and say, don't worry, I got it. It's about living generous. But you want to see heaven manifested? They literally thought heaven would manifest when they saw a wealthy man begin to take care of the poor and restore. You say, yeah, but that, don't, that ain't me. I'm not rich. Do you know that if you make at least $20,000 a year and you own a vehicle, you are in the upper 20 percentile of everyone on the planet considered rich in most of the world? Because when God gets a hold of our heart, he gets a hold of all of our stuff. Get some money. Don't, don't get nervous. Offerings are over. Not going to do an offering at the close. See, one of our, our toxic mentalities, you want to trigger people, start talking about money. People get funny when it comes to money. 
fund me when it comes to money? Really want to know what's in someone's heart? I know what they give. I know a lot of pastors don't do this, but I wasn't one of those guys when I led a church. I got a readout every month of everything everybody gave. I want to know absolutely what everyone is giving. Not because I'm going to treat anybody any different. I'm going to love everybody the same no matter what. But before I put someone in a position of leadership, I want to make sure your heart's here. Because where your treasure is is where your heart is. If you're not giving a dime, your heart ain't there. Oh, we love Hill City. What, have you given a dime? You give what you love to. You give to what you love. I go on a trip. I got a suitcase full of books. I have no problem getting up at churches. I said, listen, I need you to buy all these books because I need room in this suitcase because I got to take some toys back to my granddaughters. Because those little girls get whatever they want. Why? Because I love those little girls. They are spoiled rotten because what you love, you give to. What you don't give to goes away. living a life that says I've heard people say my whole life well God God don't need my money and I, I agree he doesn't need your money he needs his money because you don't own anything according to scripture it's no longer you that live but Christ that lives in you so you own nothing possess nothing control nothing you're just a steward of his you don't own it but again you want to trigger somebody start talking about M-O-N-E-Y See, it's already gotten quieter in here Givers should be going, hey, amen. They thought heaven would immediately appear, not because they worship better or they prayed more or they acted more righteous. They thought heaven would appear because they saw someone of substance take care of the poor and the marginalized. Did, did you realize that up until the mid-1800s, Christianity as a whole mainly was on the planet? The focus was to relieve the world of pain and stress and ignorance? In the mid-1800s is when our eschatology got all hijacked, and all of a sudden we began to believe that Jesus is going to come and rescue us from all this stuff, and he's going to fix it magically by showing up on the planet, blinking his eyes, and everything is going to be fixed. That wasn't taught before the 1800s. Before that, they actually believed that it was the body of Christ's job, our job. That's why, do you know that most of the hospitals, have you ever noticed the names of most hospitals? St. Mary's, St. Jude, Covenant. Now, they might be owned by corporations and stuff now, but they started initially by the church to relieve the world of pain and stress. All of the Ivy League schools were started as seminaries because they believed if people were educated, they'd be less ignorant. They'd be, they'd be less prejudiced. They would, they would step into their destiny and their purpose because ed, the lack of education leads to poverty. The church was all about making a difference in the world around them, not just sitting in church praying for Jesus to come and get us out of all this mess, which is like praying for the other team to win so you can leave the field. Doesn't really make sense. They thought heaven would immediately appear. You, you want to see the kingdom of God appear in this county? Keep taking care of the marginalized. Live generously. Submit every ounce of your prejudice at the feet of Jesus. All of your attitudes towards those people, whoever those people are to you, because we all experience this. We all deal with it in some form, but it has to be submitted to the Lordship of Christ because he is not that way. Jesus chose to hang out with the people that would irritate the religious on purpose. Remember this last year I kept seeing on social media, a bunch of preachers especially sent this out, and I have a lot of preachers on my timeline. And they said things like this. Jesus didn't hang out with sinners simply because he was accepting them. He hung out with them knowing that they would change, but yet scripture doesn't say that. He was not a friend of ex-sinners. He was a friend of sinners. That means there's some people Jesus got around who didn't change at all, and it didn't change how he felt about them. 
truth is he got around people just because he loved people. Period. If there's any toxic mindset, we have to lay at the feet of Jesus. It's our toxic view of ourselves and humanity, our prejudice, and our stinginess. Because when we have a heart that's like Christ, we see ourselves that we are as he is on the earth, that we are beloved of him. Then we see other humans as valuable, and then we treat everyone as valuable. We look down our nose at no one because our self-righteousness is stinkier than anything else we could ever come up with. And then we live generous, generous in our love, generous in our friendships, generous with our finances, generous in every area of our lives. And if we have no heart for that at all, we can be loved, we can be saved, and still go to heaven. It doesn't change God's mind about you, but it will affect how much of heaven flows through you. Because the point of awakening to Christ is so that the kingdom of God that's within us would flow through us to make a difference in the world around us. I, I want to encourage you, Hill City. First of all, keep doing what you're doing when it comes to reaching out in this community. I, I learned a long time ago, my wife and I, in, in now 34 years of traveling ministry, we've never lacked one time. There's been times things have gotten a little tight. We've never lacked. Why? Because Scripture says that when you give to the poor, you will never lack. It says when you give to the poor, you lend to God. How many of you would like God in debt to you? You want God to take care of you? Make sure that you're doing something to care for the poor. Whether it's a ministry that deals with the poor or whether it's through this church, whatever the Holy Spirit puts in your heart, that's between you and him. But when that is your heart, he said, you're never going to lack. Why? Because God so loved the world that he what? He gave. And when we live like that, that's how we change the world. And those toxic mindsets, those triggers, but you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said to me. I know. I know, but that's why we have Jesus. Do you know what they did to him? Do you know what they said about him? And rather than saying, Father, I call thousands of angels to wipe these ungrateful, ignorant people out. His response was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the heart of Heavenly Father. Bow your heads, would you? Father, I thank you today. I thank you that you love us and accept us unconditionally. Your acceptance of us has nothing to do even with our acceptance of you. You accept us because of your faithfulness and your righteousness, not our righteousness and not our faithfulness. But Holy Spirit, I ask that you help each and every one of us. Help us with every toxic mindset. Some of it is imparted to us from the time we're young. Some of it has to do with people that we've ran with or hung out with or things that have been done to us that gave us attitudes. But heal our prejudging, heal our attitudes towards other people and people groups. And then release the spirit of generosity like the day of Pentecost. That when Pentecost came, it wasn't just wind and shaking and fire and tongues, but it released a radical generosity on the church. That they began to turn the world upside down and heaven began to be demonstrated simply because people chose to follow you. But we don't want to just be good church people and good Christians, but followers of Jesus. Help us this week. Help us this week, this month, this holiday season to be you everywhere that we go. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, thank you, Bishop. Can we just put our hands together? I told you it would be good. I told you it would be inspiring, but also told you it would be challenging. And that is the challenge for us to continue to be generous people. That's who we are. In two ways, maybe we can do that today and over the course of this week and even next week. Um, he mentioned his book. I'm sure. Did you bring some copies? He's, he'll have some out in the lobby, Myths and Mistranslations. It is an incredible book uh, to expose some things that maybe we have gotten wrong, and it really brings some light, uh, maybe to some things that could be confusing in Scripture. He has those available. Also, if you want to support him directly and his ministry that he, so he can continue to travel with the good news all over the country and really all over the world, uh, as some new doors are opening for him, you can go to Connect international ministries.com connect international ministries.com and you can sign up for one time or even monthly reoccurring giving uh, with Bishop Jamie so that he can continue to travel also I want you to know that uh, we are putting together uh, an Amazon wish list because I told you this house is almost finished we would really love we have a family uh, hopefully in line to move in before Christmas and that is our plan so next week we will have um, an Amazon wish list to some things like silverware and kitchen utensils and bedding and all the stuff that this family is gonna need and we're gonna step up uh, do for one what you wish you can do for everyone and we're really gonna go above and beyond and really bless this family uh, through our efforts and our generosity. So be on the lookout for that. We'll make an announcement about that next Sunday. Uh, but until then, we want you to know, one, we want you to have the absolute best time because it is an amazing season we are in, uh, heading into the holidays. We want you to have an amazing month, but we also want you to know the way to have that amazing month no matter what you're going through in life, is to have the perspective, as Bishop talked about today, of knowing how much you are loved by God. So that's what we want to leave you with. That's why we leave you with this each and every single week. So church, just know you are loved, and there is nothing you can do about it. We'll see you next Sunday.